My name is Matthew Todd and welcome to Inside the Scale Up. This is the podcast for founders and executives in tech looking to make an impact and learn from their peers within the tech business. We lift the lid on tech businesses, interviewing leaders and following their journey from startup to scale up and beyond, covering everything from developing product market fit, funding and fundraising models to value proposition structure and growth marketing. We learn from their journey so that you can understand how they really work, the failures, the success, the lessons along the way, so that you can take their learnings and apply them within your own startup or scale up and join the ever growing list of high growth UK SaaS businesses. Hey, and welcome back to the podcast. Really pleased today to be joined by Joseph Williams from Clue. And great to have you here, Joseph. Thank you very much for having me, Matthew. No worries. Looking forward to the conversation today, finding a bit more about Clue, about your business that you're a co-founder of, as well as the, the journey so far. And do you want to kick things off by just giving us a little bit of a flavor for, you know, a bit about your background, a bit about Clue as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, um Unlike, um, I think, most most technology founders, um, I did not start my life in a uh, an elite university or um, <clears throat> going through the MBA path into a management consultancy or the like. Um, I actually started my career in a call centre um, because I left university. Um, <clears throat> and um, very quickly and early on in my career, realised that um, I had spent an entirety of my academic kind of career being told that I was not um, not good. Um, I was not talented. I was not skilled um, and subsequently ended up completely limiting my, my kind of the outcomes of my um, potential um, and ended up in, a, in, in this call centre environment when someone um, in the management team um, who was also um, autistic um, recognised that I might actually not be set up for success on a on a call floor, and and brought me into um, a little table that she put up outside her office, where I started looking at data, um, and thus a career in 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 digital transformation, digital innovation was born. Yeah. Um, the translation of my value that I I, I saw in that place is something that I recognise that doesn't happen for most people. Um, and so, you know, when you see that um, just this morning, the government is uh, releasing this new program to get, you know, the, the 9 million people back into work. Um, there is a systemic problem with people seeing value in the talent and skills that they have. Um, and so along my professional career and now into my full time career, that's been a point of dedication for me. Um, so Clue ultimately is a, a skills based platform transforming how companies engage with talent and a and a key part of that is helping organizations understand where their skill gaps are and then helping them reevaluate um, what it takes to do a job well and who is capable of doing it. Um, and we've built a bunch of uh, smart little tech tech tools to do that. But fundamentally, the impact is economic participation and, and, and social mobility. Yeah, no, fantastic. I think it's a great, a great cause, a great platform, and I'm sure we'll dig into more detail about some of the problems with the the way the current systems and methods tend to work. Um, but with that call centre experience and transformation, then what was the trigger or thing that gave you confidence to actually try and get Clue off the ground? Frustration. Um, <laughs> I yeah. think above, above everything, Matthew, I say, I say Clue is innovation by necessity. Um uh, I, I mentioned that um, so I have supersensory um, autism and um, also a, a chronic health condition that gives me um, quite significant mobility challenges. Um, and in my career and in the careers of all of those um, who are um, also part of the disabled neurodiverse community, the, there have been significant challenges just applying for work just getting the information you need in order to know whether you can be set up for success in an, uh, for success in an organization. Yeah. Constantly encountering systems and processes that are just limiting um, and organizations that refuse to tell you exactly what the most important thing is um, uh, for you when you are kind of going into an interview process. So recognizing that um, after spending about seven years trying to convert it from the inside, 
um, realizing that the recruitment space was part of the problem and underpinning the problem um, led me and my my business partner um, <laughs> to basically nip it in the bud and say, you know, we've got to build. If, if it's going to exist, we have to build it ourselves. Um, and this was kind of um, I'd, I'd been researching the methodology for Clue for about a year before. Yeah. But then when the pandemic yeah. hit, um, I was in another another kind of um, startup at the time. Um, I was like, why am I going to go into this period of time trying to fix someone else's problems? I said, the universe has kind of gifted us some downtime. Um, my, my business partner is also my boyfriend. Um, and so if we're going to be spending all of this time with each other uh, yeah. over the next uh, you know, X amount of months at the time um, that we thought it would be, um, let's just put our heads together and, and, and fix the problem that we want to solve. Um, and so it was, it was kind of, it was largely led by frustration, um, yeah. Yeah. and, um, and, and a deeply seated knowledge that there was a better way of doing things. Um, we, we say often that, you know, the disabled community is made up of, of creative problem solvers because that's existence, um, on a daily basis. Um, you know, you're constantly mitigating your personal risk and the risk of others around you. You're constantly finding new ways to do things because you're constantly presented with society um, and infrastructure that is not designed to support you. Um, and so, so many of these skills over index in our community and we just don't necessarily always see them as valuable. Um, and so it took a few people to kind of really push it, but yeah, um, yeah. yeah frustration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a good, a good reason. And in, in terms of the problems you saw with, existing recruitment agencies as well as recruitment processes then you know what is it that they're they're getting so wrong yeah so recruitment as a methodology is 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 basically a trade um it's a commodity people are a commodity um and because it's been designed with that sales-based um mentality we've fallen into the habit of limiting opportunity for job seekers to warrant the exclusivity of the talent that we can then sell to employers. Um, and so it's like the diamond trade, right? If you, if you limit supply, you can hike prices. Yeah. Um, and so the ethics of, of staffing and recruitment as a half a trillion uh, dollar industry a year that operates at uh, almost a 50% wastage um, in, and gets away with it. And, yeah. you know, 11, 11% 11 investment in recruitment in the UK last year on top of what it already spends is there's, it's a less, it's, it's an evil that everyone has just kind of come to accept is done in this way because that's just the way it's done. Um, but we really wanted to anchor on to what does recruitment look like if it was designed by psychologists and not by yeah. salespeople. Um, and so really we are dissolving um, a need for job boards, for recruitment agencies, because they perpetuate the barriers that are perceived and, and felt so deeply by so, so many who don't fall into that. This is someone that a client will easily understand is right for this position um, or far more yeah. insidiously. This person is just diverse. So I'm going to put them on this long list because we need to show that we're getting diverse candidates onto uh into the organization, but we know they're not going to be hired because the organization is going to turn them away. Um, it, there are a lot of ethical challenges. Um, and so it was never, it was never, it, sh it shouldn't um, still exist in its, in, in its original incarnation in this day and age. But um, yeah, unfortunately it does. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of recruitment processes from, you know, both sides of the equation as well. And I think, <laughs> An element of it as well surely must be that a lot of people doing the hiring and recruiting, you know, they have zero training that they're just copying what they've seen people do before. And they probably acknowledge that I don't really know what I'm doing here. I'm interviewing someone, but I'm just giving them this type of test, asking these questions because I feel like I have to prove my status as an interviewer and someone capable of having that responsibility. But they, they don't really know what they're doing either. Yeah. I, yes, I mean this is um, part of the uh, some of the the greatest legacy challenges that organisations face is that 
um, because it's so easy to bring your friends into into organisations and, and still is. Um, yeah. yeah, we were speaking with a, a client the other day who is a very well known um, FTSE twenty, um, and they said that they've just upped their recruitment wastage budget by almost forty um, percent because hiring managers are still just hiring their mates and, and wow. pulling in people they know and not going through central services. And you know, this is a regulated industry, and so there's kind of um, an expectation that 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 is the modus operandi. And what that does is significantly um, it's the opposite of um, empowerment. It, it kind of it is disabling. Um, it disables the impact that recruitment can have. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, yes, people are not being adequately trained um, and developed in the same way that you would be in a sales team. Um, and, and whilst you are in effect doing a very similar thing, trying yeah. to convert customers, uh, potential customers, um, but on the other hand, you also have um, a business unit that is effectively um, trading in the most valuable um, commodity that an organization has, their people, their competitive advantage. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's the, we always say it's, it's the bridge that holds the organization together that everyone likes to walk all over. Um, it, it, it's, it's completely, there's no empowerment behind it or there is seldom empowerment yeah. behind it so it is the the system isn't working and no one is really able to break the cycle um which is why we're we're, we're bringing clue to market yeah no i think that's fantastic so how does clue then work differently to that kind of ingrained infrastructure if you like yeah great question so um you will notice that um recruitment, HR, technology is um, very popular at the moment. Um, I think we're, our CAGR is about 7% um, year on year. And the challenge I have with um, a lot of technology or what is kind of touted to be technological innovation is that people see a sliver of a problem and they're like, ah, Hiring companies uh, spend an absolute fortune on all of these individual technologies. Let's yep. build something that automates that process. Or, you know, hiring managers spend so long scheduling um, interviews with prospective job seekers. Let's 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 digitize that process. Um, and 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 what's happened is we've got an entire marketplace that has been basically brought to life um, to solve challenges that are as are as as are are as a result got there eventually um yeah. of, of the traditional process but they're not looking to fix the actual process itself so what we have done is um take a step back as as always um and really understood from both sides of the table what's not working um and fundamentally organizations weren't getting the right data um, they were spending far too long um, filtering and trying to sift through um, irrelevant applications. Um, yeah. They didn't consider their talent pools to be um, <clears throat> sustainable. They have huge wastage because even the people they're hiring is basically a game of probability in most cases. Um, and 80% of people still don't have the right skills for their jobs, um, which is the the kind of the, the, the jaw crack, well, you know, the face crack moment, the jaw drop moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Gartner, um, huge study um, that they've just updated recently, and it's even less people uh, because of this massive hiring kind of um, uh, purge that has happened over the last um, kind of 18 months. Huge amounts of people being hired with the expectation that we need to um, almost compromise on quality in order to get enough people in uh, instead of broadening the opportunity pool. Yeah. So and I, I promise I'll get on to why Clue is different. <laughs> no, no, it makes so, sense that, yeah, people are trying to solve the problem in the wrong way. Well, exactly. So we have spent the best part of two and a half years designing um, a way in which you can get that the most important information from job seekers in a non-assessment and non-psychologically safe um, environment. Um, you know, people yeah. have not been academically gifted. The idea of being tested, assessed is an instant uh, deterrent. And so we see yeah. significant drop off from lower socioeconomic, more diverse communities. The second assessment is even mentioned. Um, so we needed to make sure that the that we didn't anchor it onto a clues uh, methodology onto assessment. 
Um, so we get better quality data, um, skills-based data. We understand behavioral, technical, and transferable skills by kind of level and, and, and the honing of them. Um, yeah. And then we have a similar process um, with organizations. So instead of saying, you know, here's a job, post a job, um, mm. we've built um, some ML um, code that will basically help organizations understand what skills they're actually asking for in a job spec transferable technical behavioral um triangulate that data a bunch of diff across a bunch of different things against like market data talent talent pool data kind of historic data from their organizations yeah. that present a skills matrix um a skills matrix that they can then hire against clear then matches people with those skills to those opportunities and says hey employer here's 46 people who are active and have the skills that you need um, do you want to um, engage them? And, and and that's how we source. So job seekers are not spending hours, days, weeks, months applying for 500, 600 jobs a week that they will never actually stand a chance of being hired for. Yeah. Um, and employers get much better quality applications through their into, into their funnel. So better, better data in, obviously better output. Um, and all the while, because we are focused on skills, we're able to um, build partnerships um, with anyone from um, <clears throat> Birkbeck University through Centerpoint and um, people like Ingius who are doing ph phenomenal work on upskilling, uh, reskilling and, and educating people. But then those people traditionally will then enter a job market that says, where did you work? How many years did you work? What's the yeah, job yeah. time? Um, but not with Clue. So we feed a funnel, um, we get better quality, better quality data into it um, and give employers better tools to make more accurate hiring decisions. Um, but the output is better representation, better attention and, 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 and better uh, engagement um, in, in the process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I can see why that is a model that, that certainly is more favorable in many regards, it can certainly make sure that they are you know, making far better, more intelligent hiring decisions with access to a, a better match and, and wider pool of of people that are right for those positions as well. Um, so when it came to developing this, I can see that with more people using the platform, the better that data and information gets. But how did you even start to get something like this off the ground to make sure that you've got the right methodology, but also the numbers of people needed to make that work, right? You need people on both sides of the equation. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know about you, Matthew, but not many people I know um, kind of have those moments in their career where they've not necessarily had a, a straight line, a straight path, but then it's like, oh, everything that I've done so far actually makes sense within what I need to do now. Um, yeah. I, I'm a huge believer in intentionality, um, and um, it, it, when it when when the time came that Clue was Clue was the solution, and we we kind of spent enough time with uh, in we call it R and D, but it wasn't really R and D. It was basically me just speaking to people that I I I know or was introduced to <clears throat> to qualify whether this would work and could yeah. work yeah. and how it could work better. Um, we, because I've been in the space for a while, I wasn't kind of, I wasn't saying our oh, recruitment's a challenge, let's go and try and sell a piece of technology in a market I never had exposure to before. Yeah. Um, I was able to, we were very fortunate actually, to be able to refine and test the methodology whilst building the MVP with paying clients. Um, okay. And so because of trust um, and because we'd spent so long talking with and working with organizations that uh, we wanted to work with and had them as part of the process, we were establishing trust all the time. Um, my entire professional career prior to flipping in to try and solve this problem was helping organizations establish trusted products in digital, like highly crowded digital markets. Um, yeah. And so everything I do is always kind of come back down to that, do they trust us? Um, so from the employer's perspective, because they had been part of the process and felt like this was they were building the solution. We had a really strong test bed of clients that we could um, pay, uh, that would be willing to pay for pilots um, with us as soon as we were ready to take something to market. Um, on the uh, job seeker side of things, um, leveraging um, uh, partners that I've had since my time, I've worked in ed tech, I've 
run a charity. Uh, I've been a civil rights and kind of human rights activist for the best part of two decades. And so you, you, you meet people, right? And you, and you, yeah. you, you build your network. I've always um, been a huge advocate of the power of the network. And I've never actually asked my network for, for anything I realized when I was starting this business. Um, and so I was, but I very regularly will connect people and, um, and, 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 and give people things that I think will help them at work. And, yeah. and I just, that almost subservient to your connections kind of, um, approach is just something I've always done. And I don't know why, I don't know where it really came from, but, it, but it is, I probably got told it early on in my career. So when I came around to actually asking people, Hey, I'm doing this thing. Do you want to, do you want, do you want to help? Yeah. I was blown away by how many people actually did want to, um, and, and did, mm. and did help. So we had inherent trust from the, uh, the customer's perspective, from our, from our paying customers perspective mm. organizations. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then we had, um, earned trust through, um, job seekers because we were able to partner with the right kinds of organizations that already have strong trust with them. I see. Um, and we were able to then develop trust quite quickly because what we built worked. So, um, and telling those stories and really watering those stories as much as we could, um, <clears throat> and, and taking the time to really make sure it was working. Um, I think so many people get lost with speed and haste, um, you know, kind of how quickly can you accelerate? How quickly can you kind of like learn fast and you yeah. know, kind of grow quickly? And, um, so so many businesses fail, um, I've always said that what we're doing is so much more important than the money that we're going to make. Um, and which is why we've got to take our time and do it properly. Um, very lucky to have an incredible advisory board, um, true captains of industry, um, helping us make sure that we don't make silly mistakes. Yeah. Um, but also helping us plug the gaps when it, you know, you have those moments where you've got like 30 quid in the bank and you know, you've got a 15 K overheads going out in a couple of days and you're like, I need someone to pay us something. And so some of it, oh, I know someone or, you know, all these people yeah, can do yeah. it. And that's been invaluable. But but all of it comes back down to trust. You know, if your your reputation follows you, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I I, I, I I like to think that I'm, uh, I've, I've, I've kind of earned my stripes um, in the equalities and uh, the human rights space. Um, so when it came to uh, leveraging that with a solution to make it better, um, you know, that was, that was a kind of a key part of mitigating the need to have come through, um, a massive university and, you know, have worked in managing consultancy and, you know, or, or have a family that's got a shed ton of money to help you get started. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So using that trust that you, you'd built up and then going in there with a, an authentic product, not one that was rushed. And so I think too many people do rush that. MVP stage because they it's something they want to declare that they've got and I think a lot of people can fool themselves that they've genuinely got something that's product and market viable before it really is so it sounds like you didn't take that didn't fall into that trap and actually did want to make sure it was right first yeah I mean we again we're quite um it was whenever we say we were Kind of refining the methodology and testing the methodology whilst building the MVP with paying customers. The the general reaction from investors and also the other other tech founders is like, how did you do that? Yeah. Well, I asked. Um, I, I just asked, and they they said, yeah, sure. Um, and we set parameters around it, and we kind of worked on cost to make sure that um, they understood that you know actually what they were getting was consultancy. Yeah. Um, and yeah. therefore they should actually be paying more than just using the product. Um, and they got that. Um, and <laughs> so they actually did well um, off the back of just asking. I think, you know, so many people are lost in this um, this need to be seen as successful yeah. that they feel embarrassed or compromised to ask for support. Like, it blows my mind how many people I know whose businesses have folded because they didn't or couldn't ask for help. Yeah. Um, it's... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's palpable. I definitely struggled with it in the beginning, but I've got very little shame. Um, I think one of the definite benefits of um, the, the autistic side of my brain is that a lot of those social clues I don't have, and I will walk up to anybody and I will speak to them, and and that is okay with me. Yeah. And often they like it, and they don't mind it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it works. Yeah, I think there's 
a lot to be said for just asking. And I think there's a lot to be said for that paid pilot approach and being open and honest about it. And if you do it properly, then by definition, you should be adding value to the organization that is doing that pilot with you. So why not charge for it and recognize that actually it is going to be a degree of consultancy, whether that's 100% or 50%, whatever it is, depending Mm. on the stage of your platform and business. But be honest about it. 100%. Yeah, we, 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 we live in a world that will happily drop £500,000 for a speaker for 30 minutes. You know, we we can quite happily get 5K for a, a six-week product pilot. We can yeah. quite happily get 50K for a six-month product pilot. Um, you know, if you, if you believe in your subject expertise enough that you're going to put your livelihood on it, um, the idea of trying not at least trying to get customers to see appreciate and share that value is is it's alien to me you're you're ultimately always solving massive problems that cost a lot of money um yeah (laughs) highlight that and and bill off the back of it absolutely and i think where people don't do that it might be perhaps that they don't really have the confidence in their own products or in the problem, perhaps in the way that they should. And maybe that's where they need to be spending more attention if they don't have the confidence to do something like this. 100%. I mean, my uh, I, I have an incredible coach uh, called Sharon Clues. Um, and one of the first things she said to me the first time we got a no from a, from a customer, and, you know, it, it, it hit really hard because until that point we'd had – a 100% conversion were about uh, a good like 17 customers deep. So wow. um, I was riding high. Yep. Um, yep. And then this person was like, no, I just don't think it's going to work. And it was so bruising and damaging for me. And she, and, and she just turned around to me and said that now you know who your customer isn't. Yes. And that's a really important thing. Um, use that as a, this, this is a marker Look at that person, understand their background, understand their organization, understand their priorities. You've done all of that work. Don't let that data go to waste. And that's helped us refine. I mean, we, we still, I mean, now we're probably coasting around a 40% conversion. Yep. Um, yep. But we are really focused on who sees value in, in what we do. Lots of people are interested in it. Yeah. Um, but the second you say it's tech enabled. Um, despite the fact that there are teams that help with implementation and, and all of those side of things, um, there is a sense of the assumption that the value decreases by 60, 70%. Yeah. Um, and if people won't pay it, we say we won't, we won't work with you then that's fine. Um, mm. and it's at that point that people often turn around and say, well, okay, well, look, okay. So how about this? Because if you have a good product that works, and you've got other people that are willing to back you up on the fact that it works, people will pay. Um, just people are always trying to drive down your value because they don't see you as valuable as you do. Absolutely. Um, but you have to see yourself as valuable. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of mistakes where people then take that feedback and think, oh, we need to have a lower priced product. We mm. need to lower our prices in order to get more of these people. But really what you're then doing is just trying to close more people who see your product as a nice to have, not a must have, and then it's going to be lower price, but also higher churn in respect to that as well. One hundred percent, and 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 that's such an important point, Matthew, because often um, it's not the fact that the price is wrong; it's the fact that you you haven't articulated the 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 key need. Um, and as soon as you get that, uh, so for us, we we once upon a time used to call ourselves an inclusive recruitment platform right um and so include like because ultimately yeah this is this is this is best practice um kind of uh easy to adopt plug and play inclusive recruitment um we really suffered as a result of being seen as a nice to have because we put the word inclusion in the title dni as much as we want to believe it is still a nice to have in business yeah um, or at least a va- the vast majority of people controlling the finances and controlling the programs see that. So it's the first thing to come off the radar. The second we started calling ourselves a skills-based hiring platform, um, interest, reach, traction, yeah. journalists, everyone, because everyone is talking about the skills gap. 
Um, 80% of, as we said earlier, 80% of people don't have the right skills for their job. So giving organizations tools to really understand that in a credible and meaningful way um, and being able to affect retention as a result of knowing that data, that's something that no one can, um, can, can argue isn't a massive priority, particularly as we head into this kind of period of uncertainty. And so the product hasn't changed. Yeah, but it's still doing exactly what it does before, but the way that we sell it has changed, um, and that's completely transformed our trajectory. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting, and it's the, as you say, the core of what the product does hasn't changed, but it's the perception and therefore value that people place on that that you're able to then affect and impact and ultimately, yeah, make more of a difference by helping people see it in that way as well. Exactly. I just, it's, it's just humility, right? <laughs> I think yeah. the, the, the number one skill you need to be a successful entrepreneur is, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's ego. You've got to be an egotist. And I'm like, no, it's, I completely disagree. I think it's actually humility. Um, recognizing that you do not know, you do not know the answers. You may think something is amazing. It's not probably other people are just as easily going to have your idea. Um, and, 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 and just constantly being able to get out of your own way um, is without a doubt the, the greatest tool that I've had to date. Yeah, I would echo that and also echo how hard it can be for people to let go of, you know, it could be simple things like words or phrases that they've used and, and how they perceive it, because that might be the thing that was the trigger, the spark for them. So changing the language of it can actually be a really difficult thing for some entrepreneurs to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but then in in a, in a in an environment where we always, you know, kind of fail fast, grow quickly, um, the amount of people that are reticent to change yes. in that ecosystem is um, it's kind of like do do the groundwork first. Um, funnily enough, I actually spent a year uh, during the kind of the initial R and D phase working with my coach Sharon um, on what I how I needed to show up as a CEO. Okay. Oh, I need to find job as a founder um, because I knew I'd, I'd been a CMO, I'd been a COO um, before. Um, I knew how to operate well within my lane, but I didn't know how to correlate that to across multiple different business divisions, yeah. um, multiple yeah. different teams, different personality types. Like I was always in teams where you kind of you focused on your numbers, you delivered. Um, it yeah. was very black and white, and you know th- this is part of my coping mechanism. Like I. I have to be able to quantify things in order to be able to really understand what's 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 going on and what's happening around me. Uh, it drives most people insane, but it makes me really good at my job yeah. in those lanes. Yeah. Um, a CEO is far more contextual, um, but so I was like, I either am not the CEO, or if I am going to be a CEO, how do I ensure that we develop an operating culture where? I, as well as everyone else around me, is set up for success. And so we spent that first year really getting to grips on what that operating culture kind of ethos would be and, you know, kind of values to the side because I think they're mostly ineffective and people don't do use them or utilize them in the right way. Um, in developing that um, operating culture and the operating kind of um, methodology, which is clarity, transparent, uh, clarity, accountability, transparency, trust, i.e., do we all know what we're doing? Do we all know who's responsible for that piece? Do we have clear reporting lines and what happens? Um, and do we trust people to go off and actually do it yeah. without micromanaging and without getting in the way? Um, as soon as I could articulate that, CEO was a breeze. Um, but all of that groundwork was absolutely fundamental because I never would have been able to be my kind of honing in on, okay, so that's moved up 0.3% today. So what's happening there? And so, you know, and this is happening over here. We need to reduce that and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like that doesn't correlate in this space. And I also think that that's kind of fundamental to it as well. Lots of people have come up through um, different business lines, different service lines, um, and they don't really spend the time to understand how they will be an effective CEO before they make the jump into setting up the business. Um, again, a huge destabilizer. Absolutely. I think it shows you've got a very, very good level of self-awareness in order to see that as a problem and a challenge to try and address and you know a very kind of clear thinking way to look at the way that you want to run the business as well and and not all CEOs but a lot of CEOs and entrepreneurs that get into it can often come at things from a product and solution side rather than a problem side to start with but 
because they're kind of coming from that problem side, they probably, the CEO role probably comes quite hard to some people because it really is just figuring it out as they go without too much forethought and planning. But it sounds like that coaching relationship and level of analysis has helped you to to do that pretty well. Yeah, um, I, I, absolutely. Um, I think that particularly when you come from a highly academic background, which I do not, you spend a lot of time with people telling you how intelligent and how brilliant your that that part of how you show up is. Yeah, and that's what carries you through um, your your kind of intellect. Um, there are four kind of anchors to intelligence. You've got emotional intelligence, intellect, general knowledge, and critical thinking. Yeah, um, and really general knowledge, knowledge retention, academic learning, um, potentially intellect. That that's the, the smallest part of it. It's the critical thinking and and the EQ that are the most important elements of how you um, show up as a leader. And so we often see, you know, one of the great things about Clue is we've got loads of data around the types of people that manifest the different types of skills the most. And we find people that don't go through university and higher education often have a much stronger set of behavioral and transferable skills than those that spend longer in the academic bubble yeah um um and, and that then goes through into your into your life and so a lot of these people that sit down as kind of like the the most successful people in the world you know they're, they're very good at making business decisions they are not leaders they are not ceos they should not be in that position um but you know those of us that have kind of been dragged up yeah. um, and um, you know just kind of kind of had to it's not hustle because you know hustles you know in, in many ways a bit of a luxury it's kind of like you've just got to either do or die, um, as, as the case may be, um, you develop a much more resilient set of um, behavioral skills. And the, I was at a conference the other day speaking to a bunch of um, MBA students, and I was like, you're right, it could be great. But the at the heart of what I've learned as an entrepreneur, you can have great ideas, you'll be really good at finance, you'll be really good at strategy, you can be really good at you know tech or whatever, development, all of that stuff other people can do if you as a person do not have a strong and resilient skill set in your behavioral um self in the way that you show up for others yeah you will fail you will not be a successful leader um whether and that's whether you go into a career now or whether you're going to start up your own business that is by far the most important um work that i have done and it's and it's what's what's kind of in, in many ways and making my leadership team also kind of work to that standard um, and, and kind of showing that this is the stuff that makes us thrive. This is the stuff that makes your team engaged. Um, and, and being able to do that as a, you know, with a gay, disabled, neurodiverse weirdo, you know, like I just, there's, it, it, there's, there's so much within this that challenges the, the concept of what it is to be a founder or to be successful. And there's so much that says that we shouldn't be here doing what we're doing. Yeah. But we're not superseding our entire competitive set at the moment on performance, on revenue, on customers, on growth. Um, And none of us are graduates. Yeah, I think that says a lot about what can be achieved and people's misconceptions about what is needed in order to gain entry to that kind of working environment. And that all comes back to the, the problem that you're trying to solve with clue in itself which is fantastic um so speaking of of clue then and the direction that you're going in what is the the vision for for clue you've got something that's proven so how big do you see it going at the moment the key problem we're solving is making sure the right people see the right opportunities and end up in the right organizations where they can be set up for success um, so reimagining that that top part of the model. Yeah. Um, by bringing the data sets that we are building into employee onboarding, engagement, management, mobility, um, we can completely make a kind of a paradigm shift in the way that we can start um, automating um, detailed and personalized L&D programs, organizational design um, projects, even looking at working with governments to start mapping and understanding skills shortages by regions, potential opportunities by regions, um, where we need to develop skills academies, where we don't, where we're saturated, where we should actually be looking at leveling up versus where 
you know, people are actually doing a pretty good job of it by themselves. You just haven't built the transport yeah. <laughs> infrastructure to help them mobilize it. Um, you know, this is the, um, we call it the skills-based economy. Um, transferable skills are the currency of the future. AI and machine learning are centralizing subject expertise. So people that can learn loads and loads of things in one go, like brilliant memory retention is absolutely a skill. However, it's prevalence in the working world will be slimmer. Then we'll see it even in highly technical roles like medicine, like law, um, like, like architecture. Systems will start doing a lot of this stuff and it's how you contextualize that, how you show up for work, how you, how you, how you lead, how you collaborate yeah. that are going to be the real things that underpin the skills of the future. Um, and we see ourselves as having a pivotal part in helping um, not just the working world, but also people I mean, people really understand that they have so much value that just because academia has always said it's not valuable, it's not, or it's never helped them to articulate that it is valuable, yeah. um, doesn't mean that it's not. Um, and so, you know, we have at the moment a great partnership with um, uh, DWP and job centres um, where we're helping long-term out of work, refugees, uh, disabled neurodiverse people, over 50s, care leavers, former offenders um, into, into meaningful employment, yeah. into organizations that you know with salaries and fixed fixed income salaries that i never thought was going to be possible for them because we're breaking down perception bias the personal perception bias um that impact on society on economic mobility on economies is significant um so we're currently building out a national case study um with uh, with the uk government and we hope to replicate that across um across europe in two years time and then yeah. across the us a year after that well, wow, it certainly sounds like a good vision, and I think you know a great way to utilize the data that you get as the platform grows as well. I can certainly see how once you get to national level, there's so much you can do by understanding differences in different regions and everything else as well. So, I th- yeah, I think it's you know thank you for sharing that. I think it's really interesting to see the potential that something like this could have on the business and i think especially with you know people evaluating ways of working since the whole you know lockdown covid pandemic thing and you know do people want to be in offices all the time part of the time none of the time i think it it has started to open up conversations that contribute towards that skills based economy as well so i think it's yeah super interesting that you know, you've been able to to get clue to the the stage that you have at this time as well, because I think it's you know a platform that's only going to be more needed as these kind of changes happen in business. Well, we hope so. Yeah, no, absolutely, and yeah, I want to be respectful of your time, but also I think we have covered a lot of really really interesting parts and and points to the of the journey of clue and the importance of understanding people from a behavior perspective, from a skills-based perspective, and you know how you've managed to build Clue on that basis as well as what you're ultimately helping others to do as well. So thank you again for sharing that. Is there anything you, you want to leave our audience with before we, we hang up? <laughs> Ditch CVs and start asking yourself why you're asking for graduates. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, th- I think the one thing that we resolutely see um, time and time again, is that as soon as you start really understanding and asking yourselves questions as employers um, as to why you put these barriers in place and what they actually achieve, um, the business case for them becomes slimmer and slimmer. Um, and you become so much more cognizant and aware of how to build high performance into the DNA of your business as, as, as startups, as scale ups. Um, we can't afford to hire incorrectly. But that 80% of, 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 of misalignment on skills, this is industry-wide. So you may think that you're doing a really good job at hiring the MIT kind of uh, product lead, but that person might be intrinsically toxic on a level that you just haven't given space or kind of language to yet. Um, and that could destabilize you in six, 12, three weeks' time. Um by being more intentional about what it takes to actually do the job well, you shift performance, you shift retention, you shift engagement, you shift the way that your business will grow. Um, just don't forget that. Um, we're also very, 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 very cheap to startups and scale-ups um, intentionally. Um, so, you know, if you want to use us, 
get in touch. Fantastic. I think that's a, a great way to round things off. I'll make sure we share links, obviously, back to your website in the show notes for this episode as well. So, Joseph, thank you very much for taking the time today. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, Matthew. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Inside the Scaler. Remember, for the show notes and in-depth resources from today's guest, you can find these on the website insidethescaleup.com. You can also leave feedback on today's episode, as well as suggest guests and companies you'd like to hear from. Thank you for listening.